Yeah. Last 24 hours have seen a quickening in the pace of events on the Ukrainian battlefronts, except I suspect that the two sides are working towards entirely different timetables ta and objectives. The Russians methodically, incrementally continue their aggressive attrition stroke offensive operations in Donbass. Um, we'll come in a moment to the confirmation from the Russians of further significant territorial gains and damage done to Ukrainian forces. The Ukrainians, for their part, are, I think, now increasingly doing things that have no particular military significance, but are presumably done with an eye to the Russian presidential election, which is due to take place on Sunday. And if I start with the Ukrainians, the news this morning, which is all over the internet, was of a Ukrainian attempt to breach the Russian border in Belgorod and Kursk regions to advance into Russia, presumably capture villages inside Russia, um, plant the Ukrainian flag and the flag of a dissident Russian group that is supposed to be operating with the Ukrainian armed forces, achieve the headlines which go with all of this. And anyway, that was the operation that we saw happen this morning. Now, the Russian Defense Ministry and the Russian Internal Security Agency, the FSB, which controls the Russian border troops, both say that this operation was a complete failure. I will read the report, the statement, about this event from the Russian Defense Ministry. And it says, it says the following. In the morning, the armed forces of the Russian Federation, along with the border service of the Federal Security Service, that's the FSB, thwarted the Kiev regime attempt to enter the territory of the Russian Federation in Belgorod and Kursk regions. At around 0300 local time, or Moscow time, sorry, after intensive shelling of civilian settlements, the Ukrainian formations, supported by tanks and armoured vehicles, attempted to enter the territory of the Russian Federation at the same time from three directions near Odnorobovka, Nehoteyevka, and Spodaryushino. Selfless actions of the Russian servicemen allowed, caused all of the attacks to be repelled. Aviation, missile troops, and artillery um, uh, delivered strikes at the enemy. As a result of covering units and border security servicemen actions, the Kiev regime's formations were pushed back suffering great losses. There has been no violation of the state border. So they're saying, the Russian Defense Ministry is saying, that all the attacks were repelled and the Ukrainians were unable to capture any village. Anyway, the report from the statement from the Russian Defense Ministry then concludes, of the border territory, up to 60 Ukrainian um, they call them terrorists, soldiers, let's call them, were eliminated near Odnorobovka, up to three tanks and armored, one armoured personnel carrier near Nehoteyevka, and two tanks near Spodaryushino. Moreover, from 0800 to 0825 a.m., four attacks of Ukrainian sabotage and reconnaissance groups attempting to enter the border territory near Tetkino, the Kursk region, were repelled. After suffering significant losses, the enemy withdrew. So, according to the Russians, this entire operation was a complete failure. Now, there's a number of things one must say. Firstly, I understand that there are claims in Ukraine uh, 
that the Ukrainians did manage to capture one small village and hold it at least for a time. I'm not sure whether the Ukrainians claim that they hold this village still, but I have to say that I think it is unlikely that the Russian Defence Ministry would release a statement saying that all the territory of the Russian Federation is fully under Russian control, if it were indeed the case that the Ukrainians control any single village. And, of course, this is an attack that has taken place today, um, as has been correctly pointed out by a number of commentators. The Russians obviously got wind of the attack. They'd identified the uh, base locations of these Ukrainian troops from which the Ukrainian troops were intending to launch these attacks over the previous days. Um, I mentioned yesterday in my programme that there'd been heavy Russian missile and rocket and bomb attacks on Ukrainian concentrations close to this border in this particular area. And it's likely that the Russians deployed, redeployed forces from deep inside Russia to make sure that any incursion of the border in this territory was quickly repelled. But this is one attack, or rather one series of attacks, that has taken place today. We're still days away from the Russian election on Sunday, and it's entirely plausible that we will be getting more attacks in this area before long. Now, one Russian or telegram channel, it might have been Slavyangrad, uh, reported that the total number of Ukrainian troops um, that were deployed in this attack came to two battalions, which would imply that Ukraine committed roughly a thousand men to this attack, which means that it is not a small attack. And, of course, the Russians say that uh, Ukraine lost 60 men in the attack near Odnorobovka and suffered further significant losses in other places. The Russians are not claiming that they made a complete account of all Ukrainian losses. But they also say that Ukraine has lost what looks like a significant amount of equipment. They say that um, in the attack um, near Odnorobovka, the Ukrainians lost three tanks and one armoured vehicle, one armoured personnel carrier. And um, in the attack near Spoda Ryushino, they lost a further two tanks. Five tanks in total out of what one suspects is a diminishing pool of tanks within the Ukrainian army. Now I say that because, well, as we've all seen over the last couple of days, the Ukrainians deployed their Abrams tanks to Berdichi and a number of Commentators again suggested that they would only do that in the event that their other tanks, the Leopard 2s and the T-64s and the T-72s, the numbers of those tanks was becoming depleted. But there's perhaps a further sign that um, armoured vehicle numbers are starting to fall in Ukraine is that they've apparently been Fanning, uh, officials have been fanning across Ukraine, taking um, old tanks and armoured vehicles which have been set up as monuments in various locations, taking them down and have been pressing them into service and sending them to the battlefronts. Now, many people suppose that this is a sign that Ukraine is suffering a shortage of armoured vehicles, and I suspect that is probably true. Though I would quickly add that it's likely anyway 
that in most cases the Ukrainian authorities want to dismantle the monuments that these armored vehicles that these armored vehicles are part of. These are presumably old Soviet monuments. And as I said, the Ukrainian authorities pursuing their policy of de-Sovietization probably are anxious to pull down these monuments. But having said that, it does still seem a curious thing to do to <laughs> dismantle these armored vehicles and press them into service. And it could be another sign that the Ukrainians are indeed starting to run short of armored vehicles. In which case, throwing away five tanks in an attack like this on Russian territory does seem rather profligate. Anyway, we will see what else the Ukrainians plan to do. I am sure, as I'm sure the Russians also are, that the Ukrainians are probably planning something dramatic before Sunday's election. Um, Kirill Budanov, Ukraine's intelligence chief, recently went to Kherson region. He made a rather um, sensational presentation saying that Ukraine is planning another major strike against Crimea. Um, he said that they're going to fight on to gain control of the Black Sea and to achieve victory over the Russians there. Um, he said that Ukraine would act to make sure that the people of Crimea knew that they weren't forgotten. Which, by the way, is a somewhat double-edged comment. It might be construed in the West as a reassurance to the people of Crimea. I suspect many people in Crimea would see it or interpret it in a different way coming from Budanov, which is more as a threat. But anyway, so one way or the other, it is likely that what the Ukrainians, that the Ukrainians are planning still to do something further between now and Sunday, it's unlikely that this operation that we've just seen on the border is their last word before the presidential election on Sunday. These operations are pointless and irrelevant and meaningless. They are not going to change in any possible way the eventual outcome of the war. They throw away the lives of men, um, Ukrainian troops, some of them no doubt special forces, who are being needlessly sacrificed for what is essentially another <laughs> presentational purpose. We've seen it that, according to the Russians, the Ukrainians have just lost five more of perhaps their diminishing quantity of tanks. It doesn't change the situation on the battlefronts in any way. And the same is true of a gigantic, by their standard, uh, drone offensive that the Ukrainians also launched yesterday. Now, these are very different drones from the Geranium-2 drones that the Russians operate and launch day after day, night after night against Ukraine. They're on a much more homespun um, basis. Ukraine has never been able to launch the industrial manufacture of drones on a huge scale in the way that Russia is doing. But nonetheless, on odd days, the Ukrainians are able to cobble together a significant number of drones. And last night, they launched large numbers of them against Russian territory. Now, the Russians say that they managed to bring down all of these drones, bar one, which did get through and hit an oil refinery and uh, caused a fire and some damage. And that may again be true. I suspect that the Russians are once again saying the truth about this. But once more, to reiterate, 
These are pinprick attacks. The Ukrainians seem unable to hit successfully really important Russian targets since Ukraine began its drone offensive, such as it is, about a year ago. The Russians have significantly hardened their anti-drone defences. There have been fewer successful Ukrainian drone strikes on Moscow. These pinprick attacks, again, achieve nothing. In fact, to the extent that they achieve anything, it is, simply, it is to highlight the enormous discrepancy in striking power between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Anyway, that was what the Ukrainians did early this morning and last night, a big drone attack which appears to have had minimal success and which would anyway have had only minimal effect and a demonstration attack on the Russian border, probably the first of more to come, which panicked some civilians in these border villages, some Russian civilians in these border villages, but which seems to have achieved nothing overall except the deaths of more men and the loss of more machines. And I would say that if the Ukrainians do launch a further attack, if they are able to capture the old village in Russia, it's not going to make any difference. And it is certainly not going to divert the Russians from their course. Anyway, let's now turn to what the Russians have been doing. And this morning, we got a report from the Russian Defense Ministry and it confirmed the capture by the Russians of the village of Nevolskoye, which is located northwest of Krasno Krasnogorovka. And this is what the Russian Defense Ministry said about this. They said, in the Donetsk direction, units of the Yug group of forces have liberated Nevolskoye and taken more advantageous lines and positions. And they say that they've also launched attacks in the village of Belogorovka. This has been a village in the northwestern part of Lugansk region, which the Russians captured in the... Um, late summer, early summer of 2022, at which point, by the way, they said that they were in full control of the whole of Lugansk region. The Ukrainians then recaptured this village over the course of their Kharkiv counteroffensive. The Russians are now in the process, apparently, of storming and recapturing this village again. It has been bitterly fought over. But anyway, the long and short of it is that um, in this area, the Russians have managed to apparently make further progress in Novo Mikhailovka. We'll come back again. They've also perhaps been making more progress in Belogorovka. But they have, as the Russian Defense Ministry says, liberated or captured Novolskoy. Now, Novolskoy is one of these tiny places that, in terms of population and economic importance, is insignificant. But it is, at least for a short time, important in the tactical game of checkers that the Russians are playing against the Ukrainians in central Donbass. Novolskoye lies between Avdevka and Krasnogorovka to the south. Um, the, it also lies, Novolskoye lies to the southeast of Pervomaisky. And there are now reports that the Russians 
are making significant progress in Pergolmaisky, important village to the southwest of Avdevka. It's rather a large village. The Ukrainians have defended themselves, defended themselves um, fiercely in this village. They've contested Russian attempts to capture this village, but steadily, incrementally, the Russians have been taking more and more of it. And again, I'm not the best person to read maps, but from what I can see, based on the latest map readings that the various map mappers have provided, Suryak and the military summary channel and all of the others, the Russians now do seem to be in control of the greater part of the village of Perovomaisky. Now, why is this important? Well, Nevelskoye and Pervomaisky are to the north of Krasnogorovka. The Russians have been attacking Krasnogorovka from the south. They apparently now have full control of all of Krasnogorovka, south of a railway line which bisects this town. Uh, town of about 14,000 people before the war. There were there was film made provided a couple of days ago showing a Russian armoured column advancing and attacking Krasnogorovka from the east with Nivelskoye under Russian control, perhaps with Pervomaisky also under Russian control before long. The Russians will be in a strong position to attack Krasnogorovka from the north as well. And as I discussed in a recent program, what the Russians apparently seek to do when they attack these fortified towns, the string, these fortified towns close to Donetsk city, what they like to do is to attack simultaneously from multiple directions. So they now control part of Krasnogorovka from the south. They were advancing towards Krasnogorovka from Marinka and they've been able to occupy its southern suburbs. They're in a position to strike at Krasnogorovka from the east. They have local control of the fields immediately to the east of Krasnogorovka, control of Nivolskoye, and perhaps before long of Perbomaisky, makes it also possible for the Russians to attack Krasnogorovka from the north as well. A simultaneous attack from three different directions. Now, Nivolskoye and Perbomaisky might also be important in one other respect, in that I've discussed previously in other videos, the dense nature of the built-up areas in Donbass, the fact that Donbass overall consists of a dense network of small towns and industrial villages linked up by railway and uh, railways and um, small canals and rivers, which makes this a natural area for defenders. But it's clear that as you start to push west, beyond Avdevka, for example, and beyond Bakhmut, the population density, the density of inhabited areas begins to thin and instead of close, closely packed towns you start getting more isolated towns and settlements um, located with wide expanses of fields and steppe land which of course create fewer opportunities for fortifications and defense lines to be established. And if you look at a map of uh, Novoska and Pervomaisky, if you 
were to push from these villages in a southwestern direction, so far as I can see, there aren't any significant obstacles before you arrive at the important town of Kurachovo, um, to the some distance to the southwest. And in addition, it does look, though here I have to be particularly careful, as I do find it rather difficult to make much sense of the road, of the maps at this point, but it also seems to me that if you also advance southwest from Novelskoy specifically, you start to create a situation where Krasnogorovka starts, begins to become threatened from the west as well. It begins to look as if it risks being placed in operational encirclement. And some of the roads leading to Krasnogorovka from the west start to be threatened as well. Now, that also, of course, is the pattern of Russian operations against these fortified towns, of which, of course, Krasnogorovka is one. You attack them from multiple directions, and you don't try to encircle them. You don't create a cauldron around them. The only place where the Russians, uh, uh, urban place where the Russians did create a cauldron was Mariupol. Um, you don't try to create a cauldron because doing that is very challenging and exposes you to the risk of counterattacks. But you take a particular place that you're trying to attack into a semicircle and that puts you in a position to cut or threaten the use by Ukraine of the supply roads. So supplies to the troops defending the fortified town become increasingly difficult, even as they're being simultaneously attacked from all directions. And with Novoskoy having been captured and Permovaisky likely to be captured before long, it seems to me that with respect to Krasnogorovka, the Russians are coming increasingly close to that position. So it is likely that we're going to see a major attack by the Russians on Krasnogorovka at some point over the next few weeks. I suspect that they will want to sort out Pergomaisky first, though who knows, I might be wrong about that. Once Pergomaisky falls, we could probably start to see the Russians sending tanks and armoured vehicles to the southwest. No doubt there are Ukrainian troops in the fields, no doubt the Ukrainians have laid mines, but there are few natural objects obstacles and no urban ones. Um, don't seem to be many streams or rivers here either. So the Russians have shown that they're effective in clearing minefields. They can probably clear whatever minefields the Ukrainians have created and they can probably push through whatever trenches and such fortifications as the Ukrainians hurriedly improvise, and they can outflank the Ukrainians in Krasnogorovka and simultaneously perhaps threaten Kurachovo as well. Now, as I've discussed in various programs, the Ukrainians have created a string of fortified villages and towns close to Donetsk city. Avdevka was the most important and the most heavily fortified. It was in some ways the linchpin of the Ukrainian military positions around close to Donetsk city. 
but other places were the village of Pesky, um, Marinka, Krasnogorovka. Krasnogorovka is the last one of any great size that um, remains under Ukrainian control if and when the Russians capture Krasnogorovka. Well, when rather than if. Um, at that point, one can say finally and conclusively that Ukraine's long siege of Donetsk city has been broken and Ukraine's ability to continue to, sh to sell, to shell um, Donetsk city has in effect come to, well, not a complete end, but to a virtual end. So, an important battle shaping up here. And as I said, the Russians have made significant progress in this area. Well, there's also been reports from other places on the battlefronts. Um, there continues to be very heavy fighting for the three villages of Orlovka, Berdichi, and Toninka. I saw a very interesting report on Slavyangrad discussing the fighting for these villages, saying that, in fact, what the Ukrainians are doing is that even as the Russians gradually squeeze them out of these three villages, the Ukrainians repeatedly counterattack. Clearly, they're under orders from Sirsky to go on attacking in this area. And this report from Slavyangrad went on to say that the effect of this is that it is causing Ukraine to lose more and more men and machines, that it's notable that Ukraine is increasingly being forced to use its best Western equipment along this particular part of the battlefront in the Avdevka sector. And that Sirsky's tactics, not for the first time, are working in favour of the general Russian policy of attrition. So that whatever improvised lines the Ukrainians are able to hurriedly put together further to the west, in front of um, Pakrovsk, for example, uh, there won't any longer be strong formations trained troops of which Ukraine has only a limited number available to man these fortified positions. Um, I would say that the Russian Air Force has again been very active in the Avdevka area. It has also, by the way, been very active in Krasnogorovka. Now, there's more pictures of Krasnogorovka, the industrial sector, which unusually for Donbass towns, seems to be located in the center of Grasnogorovka. Anyway, it is being particularly heavily bombed by the Russian Air Force using 1,500 kilo bombs. Um, supposedly, by the way, Sirsky himself recently visited Grasnogorovka. Uh, it's unknown whether he was there when the bombing was taking place. But anyway, one way or the other, the Russians are pushing hard in this area. And if we go further south from Krasnogorovka, again, accumulating information that the Russians are very close to capturing Georgievka, this village to the west of Marinka. And it seems that Ukrainian positions in this village are now also being outflanked. And it could very well be that the Ukrainian positions overall in Georgievka are starting to collapse. And as I've discussed from previous programs, even as the Russians seem to be working primarily at the moment to capture Krasnogorovka, by doing so, they're also laying the groundwork for the attack on Kurakovo, 
um, an important town further to the west, if Krasnogorovka, Karvomaisky, um, Nevolskoy fall, that opens the way for an attack on Kurachovo from the northeast. Um, if Georgievka and other villages to the west of Georgievka are also captured by the Russians, that enables the Russians to attack towards um, Kurachovo from the east as well, directly from the east. And, well, we're now also getting further reports that the Russians are making further progress in the Novobikhailovka area. They seem to have captured more of the fields and positions around Novobikhailovka. There are reports that the Ukrainian troops in Novobikhailovka, who still control, well, who control um, only a part of this village now, that they now are at serious risk of being encircled with suggestions that they might be obliged to withdraw. Well, again, going back to the game of checkers, if the Russians capture both Novobikhailovka and a couple of weeks further um, Kurachovo, that interrupts the supply lines, many of the supply roads, to Vugledar, to the south, one of the most strong Ukrainian fortified positions um, in the entire entirety of Donbass, one which the Russians have broken their teeth on on several occasions, but with the serious risk now that Kurakov, that Vugledar might have its supply lines cut, and again, talking more about the Jekers game, even as the Russians move to take first Krasnogorovka and then Kurachovo, they're also apparently taking the first steps towards uh, the eventual attack on Vugledar. There's been apparently Russian attacks to the southwest of Vugledar, not apparently intended to attack for the moment Vugledar itself, but capturing territory to the southwest of Vugledar, which would mean again that once Kurachovo and Novomikhailovka and all of these other places have been captured, the Russians would be able to launch simultaneous attacks on Kurachovo, on, on sorry, on Vugledar from multiple directions from the village of Pavlovka, to the south, immediately to the south of Vugledar, captured by the Russians in the autumn of 2022. From the southwest, from the territory they're now in the process of capturing, from the northeast, from Novomikhailovka, with all the roads interrupted, and from the north, from Kurachovo as well. So, one could see the kind of game that the Russians are playing, a complex game of checkers, but it is becoming easier for them to play this game as the Ru Ukrainian fortifications thin, as the populated centers in Donbass also thin, and as the landscape therefore opens up, and of course, as the Ukrainian military itself grows weaker. Now, it's not only in this area in central Donbass where the fighting is taking place. There's a lot more fighting going on, very difficult um, fighting going on in the Bakhmut area. Now, here again, we don't have a huge amount of information about exactly what is going on, but an interesting and unusual fact, the latest report from the Russian Defense Ministry says absolutely nothing about the state of the fighting in Bakhmut. Now, 
It's always covered the fighting in Bakhmut in detail up to this point. We saw with the fighting in Avdevka that when the situation reaches a certain pitch, when the Russians are on the brink of some important advance, they stop discussing the fighting in a particular location. For several weeks before Avdevka fell, the Russian Defence Ministry stopped providing information in its military updates about what was going on in Avdevka. And suddenly the same thing has been happening about the fighting west of Bakhmut and east of Chasif Yard. And that might not be completely unconnected with some reports that I was seeing earlier this morning that Ivanivska has fallen. Now, I should say that one particular Russian commentator, I believe it was Colonel Kassad, uh, reported early this morning that claims that the Ukrainians had been pushed out of Ivanivska were wrong. He did say that the Russians control around 60% of this village, which is less, by the way, than some others are claiming. But others are saying this morning that Ivanivska has actually fallen. We'll have to wait and see. But clearly something is going on. And as I said, it is striking that the Russian Defence Ministry has stopped telling us about what is going on in the Bakhmut area. And then, last but not least, um, there is this continuing, ongoing fight for Rabotino, or rather for the ruins of Rabotino. The Russians have been playing a complex game, advancing into Rabotino, drawing Ukrainian reserves into Rabotino, withdrawing from Rabotino, allowing the Ukrainians to occupy positions in Rabotino. The Russians then counterattack. They're able to deploy their heavy weapons, their aircraft, their um, missiles, their um, TOS-1 flamethrower tanks against the Ukrainian positions in Rabotino. Um, it's difficult to know exactly what is going on, there was another video from a Ukrainian soldier saying that, you know, the situation in Rabotino is very bad. And this soldier seemed to say that you, know, you don't, whatever you do, you don't want to be in Rabotino at the present time. And um, anyway, a lot of fighting apparently still going on. Uh, for Rabotino, there's been suggestions that the Russians again occupy at least a part, some say most, of this village. Um, there was also a complaint by a Ukrainian artillery unit um, picked up by The Economist, <laughs> um, which said that, in which the commander of this unit complained that he needs 150 shells a day if his unit is to function properly, but he's only getting around 20 to 30 shells a day. And that means that he can't shell the Russians as heavily as he would like. So anyway, a lot going on in Robotino. It's difficult to know exactly all the details. Now, alongside all of these developments, all of which, by the way, point to continued Russian progress and, importantly, continued Russian progress during the Rasputitsa, all of those reports we were getting a few weeks ago that the Russians were up against a timetable, they had to capture all sorts of places and complete their offensives by certain time because otherwise the Rasputitsa would settle in making further Russian progress impossible. Well, those reports, at least for the moment, look like they were wrong. Anyway, with all the news of progress, 
we've had all kinds of information about personnel changes. Now, I've discussed in several places my own skepticism about the way in which the Ukrainians have deployed tanks in Berdichi, Abrams tanks in particular. It seemed to be wasteful use of these precious tanks. It didn't make a huge amount of sense to me. Well, there are reports today that Sierski has just sacked the commander of the 47th Mechanized Brigade, the unit that operates the Abrams tanks. And that would make this commander, apparently the sixth commander, who has commanded this brigade over the course of the last year. The 47th Mechanized Brigade, what was supposed to be the brigade that would break through the Russian defense lines in the summer offensive, opening the way for other units of the Ukrainian army to pile in and push on towards the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. This brigade, not only has it been very badly knocked about in almost continuous battles, but it's having one commander replacing another. It has never achieved full stability of command. I remember Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis pointing out before Ukraine's summer offensive began that the commander of the 47th Mechanized Brigade, the first commander, was far too young and therefore far too inexperienced to exercise command over a brigade like that. Anyway, so he apparently, the latest one, not he himself, but his successor has now also been sacked. As I said, we're, in, we're now on to the sixth or seventh commander of this brigade. But there's also reports that the commander of Ukraine's air defense forces has also been sacked. Now, this is not confirmed, but apparently his name has vanished from the Ukrainian Defense Ministry's um, information system, which is leading more and more people to think that he probably has been sacked. Presumably, he is being penalized for the loss of so much of Ukraine's air defense system, the Patriots that I've discussed in recent programs, the S-300s. There's reports that the United States has been extremely upset by the loss of the Patriot missile systems and has made it clear that it opposes this game that Ukraine has been playing of trying to move these expensive and cumbersome air defense assets, the Patriots and the S-300s, close to the battlefield and trying to have them roaming around the countryside, shooting down Russian fighter jets. I've said already that there is growing skepticism, including in Ukraine itself, about those Ukrainian claims to have shot down all those Suhoi-34 fighter jets that the Ukrainian air defense was claiming at one time. I noticed, by the way, that those claims seem to have melted away. I haven't seen or heard much of that recently. And anyway, this Air Force general appears, or probably has been, dismissed. Well, going back the reports about the shooting down of Russian fighter jets. We've not seen much or indeed any real corroboration of this. There's no pictures or, or the debris that one would expect or of the actual shooting down of these planes. We have had over the last 24 hours a pretty dramatic picture of a Ukrainian MiG-29 being shot down 
apparently by a long-range air-to-air missile fired by a Russian fighter jet over a long distance. It, it's an extremely dramatic film, and apparently the MiG-29 pilot was killed in after his plane was shot down. There's been reports recently in the Russian Defense Ministry updates that um, the Ukrainians have dropped some precision-guided bombs, or tried to drop some precision-guided bombs on the Russian forces. I wonder whether this MiG-29, which must be one of the few survivors of Ukraine's once extensive MiG-29 fleet, whether that MiG-29 was involved in these attacks, these rather desperate attacks on the Russian forces. But anyway, we've got pictures of that particular fighter jet being shot down. So we have pictures of a fighter jet being shot down, but it's been provided by the Russians and shows a Ukrainian fighter jet being shot down. Not the Ukra Ukrainians shooting down a Russian fighter jet. But anyway, the air defense chief has been fired. It looks like the air defense assets are being withdrawn. And there's also there was also a report yesterday, which I cannot confirm, which is that after the loss of the Abrams tanks, the Ukrainians are pulling out many of their armored vehicles from the Avdevka area. They've come to realize that these armored vehicles are too vulnerable to counteraction by the Russians. So there we are. That seems to be the situation on the battlefronts overall. Continued Russian progress. It's not all one way. There are reports, again, they haven't been confirmed, that the Russians are planning, are, are, are replacing the Admiral in Chief of the Black, the Admiral in Command of the Black Sea Fleet. He's been in harness since 2019. The one thing that makes me a little cautious about this is that there have been claims that this particular Admiral has been sacked before. There have also been reports, by the way, that the Ukrainians have killed this particular admiral. But, of course, those reports weren't true. Anyway, we'll have to wait and see whether any of that is correct. So that's the situation on the battlefronts. Continued military progress overall by the Russians. And the Ukrainians increasingly disorganized and being pushed back in various places, even as they try these stunts with the attack on Belgorod and the rest. Now, let's turn to other things. CNN has now published an article which finally admits, and fully admits, that which Brian Belletic and I and others have been saying for a long time, which is that the Russians currently are producing at least three times more shells than the entire collective West is doing. And that in itself is a remarkable admission. I think that the figure given for Russian shell production, which is 250,000 shells a month, 3 million over the course of a year, I believe that is too low. I've been given reason to believe that the true figure of Russian shell production at the present time is in excess of 4 million. I'm just saying. So, <laughs> Russian shell production significantly outpacing that of the West. And CNN admits that even if all Western plans to increase shell production come to fruition, the West will still only be producing half the number of shells that the Russians are producing, 
and of course the Russians likely will be increasing shell production even more between now and the end of 2025 when these projections for increased shell production in the United States and Europe well finally um, um, are achieved. So the Russians clearly winning the race to produce shells and this of course doesn't take into account any imports of shells from North Korea that the Russians may be making and from other places. I would add one further point to this CNN report, not touched on in the report itself, at least not to the degree that might be needed, which is that, of course, European and American shell inventories have now become catastrophically depleted. I understand that there is now a severe shortage of shells um, in the Indo-Pacific region that the US military could call upon and um, some of whatever increase in shell production the United States achieves will have to be used to make up to make up for the shortages of shells that the US military is now afflicted by. So, um, what does this mean? Well, CNN says that he who produces the more shells in this conflict is likely to win the war. Based on what CNN is therefore saying, the Russians, sooner or later, before long, are going to win this war. It is on CNN's own calculus almost certainly likely to be the case. But of course, the issue of shell production remains vitally important and we see that the Russians are outproducing the Western shells. But as I said in my previous program, this discounts how much more sophisticated Russian firepower has been becoming over the last two years. Because as well as shells, the Russians clearly have significantly increased production of their TOS-1 flamethrower multiple launch rocket systems. We see more and more of these operating to deadly effect on the battlefronts. The Russians have also clearly increased production of their Tornado precision guided multiple launch rocket systems. The equivalent of the HIMARS systems, the Russian equivalent of the HIMARS systems, they also are becoming increasingly active on the battlefronts. The Russians have increased in their production of their precision guided shells. The Americans at one point were supplying Excalibur shells. These are GPS guided artillery shells to the Ukrainians. There was an awful lot made about the effectiveness of the Excalibur shells um, that they were supposed to be. There were another one of the weapons that were supposed to be a game changer. We were told that they were going to increase the effectiveness of the Ukrainian artillery by multiples. We stopped hearing very much about the Excalibur shells some time ago. Presumably the Ukrainians still have some, but we're getting reports that the Russians have been increasingly successful in jamming the GPS systems that they use for their guidance, so maybe that's the problem. Or maybe, maybe the Ukrainians expelled, uh, uh, rather used up, most of these Excalibur shells during their summer offensive and the United States isn't able to replace them. By contrast, we're getting more and more reports every day of the Russians using more and more Krasnopol laser-guided, precision-guided shells. Now, the Krasnopol is, in some respects, a less sophisticated 
system than the Excalibur. It is as accurate, but as it's laser guided, it presumably needs a, a laser beam to designate the target. And one must assume this is mostly provided by a drone. <laughs> um, but as often happens, the simpler Russian weapon is apparently easier to produce in quantity and more resilient on the battlefronts than the more sophisticated and expensive American system. So we're seeing fewer and fewer Krasnopol, uh, fewer and fewer Excaliburs and more and more Krasnopols. And as Dima at the Military Summary Channel pointed out in one of his recent videos, there's been a steady increase in the number of cases where we can identify artillery strikes on specific Ukrainian positions as having been carried out by Krasnopol rounds. So all of that too. The Russians are now, as I discussed in my other program, my last program, they're bombing the Ukrainians massively and they are uh, launching at least 100 precision-guided bombs against the Ukrainians a day. And on certain days, they've used many more bombs than that. Um, the number of bombs they dropped on Avdeevka on any one day, sometimes, as I recall, numbered in the hundreds. And, of course, the Russians have been increasing the size of their air force and they've been the Russian um, aviation ministry has provided the Russian air force with more Suhoi 34 and 35 fighter jets and also more Suhoi 57 stealth fighter jets it's not again clear exactly how many of these stealth fighter jets the Russians now operate over Ukraine but I've heard a suggestion that it's around 25. That may not seem like a lot but these are apparently very advanced aircraft. We don't see them as very visible and the Russians don't talk much about them but it, it does seem that they have been operating over the Ukrainian battlefronts for some time. All of this takes us back again to Western production problems. We're now told that the earliest deliveries of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine will be in July, and that only six F-16s will be delivered in July. The Russians have been systematically shooting down Ukrainian aircraft. As I discussed over the course of the autumn, they were extremely successful in shooting down large numbers of Ukrainian aircraft. And we've just seen that they managed to shoot down another MiG-29 um, just um, over the last couple of hours. So... A more powerful Russian air force. We're told that the Russians from mid-summer will start to deploy heavy drones. Perhaps the Ochotnik stealth jet-powered drone, very powerful machine. Maybe that will be operating over Ukraine from late summer. Maybe there will be other drones operating as well. So we could see how the balance is shifting increasingly towards the Russians. And I've discussed yesterday in my program how the Russians are able to destroy more and more Western systems, Abrams tanks, Patriots, those kind of things, Caesar howitzers. Since I made that program, there were reports that the Russians have destroyed another Caesar howitzer. And... The Russians, in their very latest report, the one that came out this morning, 
say that they destroyed another high mars launch vehicle and apparently there are pictures of the russians um successfully doing so so the military balance in ukraine in the fighting in ukraine continues to shift steadily towards the russians and away from the ukrainians even as the military even as um we see all the talk oh, even as we see the russians continue to make progress on the battlefronts and i wonder i really do wonder whether this isn't why again we're getting these articles suddenly appearing in cnn we had a whole succession now of telltale signs in the united states that there is growing concern within the united states about the direction of travel of the situation in ukraine we had i think it's about two weeks ago now the article in the new york times about the cia intelligence bases in ukraine disclosing an enormous amount of information about what the cia had been up to in ukraine we've had victoria newland's resignation and as one or two people have pointed out on the threads of our videos on the duran it's interesting that we've had a statement from and from tony blinken discussing and in connection with Newland's resignation, and I've passed that statement in several videos now, but there has not been a word from Victoria Newland herself. She's not said anything about why she is leaving the government, and she's not saying anything about what she might decide to do when she starts her retirement. So we've had the resignation of Victoria Newland, which looks to me increasingly like a push. She, she was pushed out. We've had more briefings of people in Congress, um, William Burns and um, Avril Haines of the intelligence community, talking about an increasingly bad situation on the battlefronts. Burns, the CIA director, talked about the Russians being a capable and resilient enemy, which is new language coming from the US intelligence community. And uh, there was acknowledgement that the Russians would soon likely gain more ground unless much more American aid was sent to Ukraine quickly and now we've had this article which has appeared in cnn which basically admits that the united states is losing the shell production war and that there doesn't seem to be anything that can be done to correct that now i can't get this i can't get away from the feeling that all of this shows that within the intestines of the American government, the Pentagon, the military industrial complex, the foreign policy community, there is now a growing sense that Project Ukraine has gone as far as it can. And it's important for the United States to tip away even Burns said that if Ukraine were to be given the $61 billion, it would only be enough to keep Ukraine going until the first part of 2025. Now, that's not quite how he put it, but essentially, that's what he said. So the $61 billion, were it ever given to Ukraine, would only buy Ukraine a certain amount of time. 
it would not change the overall picture. And I think that this is being gradually understood in Europe, that the war in Ukraine is being lost. We have seen the extraordinary behaviour of Emmanuel Macron, his attempts to create a military coalition to go to Ukraine, to send troops to Ukraine, has attracted the support of only relatively insignificant players, President Pavel of the Czech Republic, a couple of Baltic leaders, and the Foreign Minister of Poland, who does not, it seems, speak for his government. I, increase, I think it is increasingly unlikely that that is going to happen. And, well, despite some words to the contrary from Annalena Baerbock, the German government has now made its most categorical statements about the Taurus missiles. Olaf Scholz has spoken out and has said that the Taurus will not be supplied to Ukraine, either directly or indirectly. Indirectly, of course, refers to David Cameron's ridiculous proposal that Germany give Taurus missiles to Britain in return for storm shadow missiles from Britain to Germany, with the British then supplying the Taurus missiles to Ukraine. At least that is what I understand David Cameron's proposal to be. Others have interpreted his proposal in a different way. But anyway, whatever it was, um, Olaf Scholz has rejected it. He went further and said that this was a final decision. And I get the sense that apart from Annalena Baerbock, who inevitably seems open to David Cameron's idea, on this occasion, the decision not to supply the Taurus missiles seems to represent a consensus within the German government. It's important to say that the Bundestag, the German parliament, has twice voted against this idea. So, overall, I do get the sense that Project Ukraine is starting to come to a close. We are at the beginning of the end game. There's even been an admission in The Economist of all places about the resilience of the Russian economy. There's an acknowledgement, for example, that effective action by the Russian finance ministry and the central bank have managed to bring inflation in Russia back under control, that inflation in Russia is now falling, and that this is being done without this impacting significantly on underlying growth. The Economist remarkably has even conceded that. So, it does look as if Project Ukraine may be coming to an end. Now, however, having said all of that, if that is true, well, there are a number of things to say. Firstly, there will always be, of course, those who push back. The president himself, probably, in the United States. People like Blinken, Tony Blinken, and um, others. I doubt that they're reconciled to the end of Project Ukraine. I doubt that these decisions are being made by them. The others, like important people in the British government, though interestingly, a former Ukrainian ambassador to Britain has now come forward and has said that the new Ukrainian ambassador to Britain, um, Valery Zaluzhny, is going to find that the British are now becoming unforthcoming. The former Ukrainian ambassador, Vadim Pristaiko, is, um, is reported to say, unfortunately, everybody's getting tired of the war now in its third year, 
and our British friends are getting tired too. And I say that the new envoy, meaning Zeluzhny, will have to find new arguments and new means for supporting Ukraine, revitalizing the provision of assistance to, to Ukraine by our Western partners being the major task. Great Britain has mostly exhausted its resources, including military ones. We have been given everything that could be given. So even the British, maybe, are starting to understand that they've reached the end of the road. But no suggestions about trying to steer a political course out of this mess. And of course, without a proper negotiation taking place, as the situation on the battlefronts deteriorates, there is always the risk that someone in the West might decide to do something irresponsible and reckless, that Macron might indeed suddenly insert his troops into Ukraine, or someone else might do something equally irresponsible. I do not understand why it is so difficult if there is an acknowledgement that the war is all but lost to take this essential step before the end comes. It's almost as if some people in the West actually do want a Saigon moment in Kiev. Extraordinary though I find it. Anyway, that's my programme for today. More from me soon. You can find all our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X, links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop, get uh, yourself the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. Don't forget also that you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. If you like this video, please remember to tick the like button and check the sub your subscription to this channel. And more from me tomorrow. And until then, have a very good day.